So my name is Tanya Venture and I'll be presenting this on behalf of uh, Dr Hannah Fluck, who's my PhD supervisor, and um, one of her colleagues, Dr Meredith Wiggins. Um, they both work for Historic England as part of a team looking at strategic threats and opportunities for the historic environment. Um, so this presentation was written by Hannah and Meredith, who, who both send their apologies for not being here. Um, it does say that all the views expressed here are those of myself and of Hannah and Meredith and shouldn't be necessarily be taken as totally representative of those of Historic England. So first, um, I'll present a brief background to uh, archaeology, policy and climate change in England and where Historic England fits into this. Uh, then I'll explore some of the challenges and opportunities that climate change poses for heritage, in particular for archaeology, and how Historic England is, is engaging with some of these issues. And finally, I'll pose some challenges um, for the wider archaeology archaeological sector. So Historic England is an arm's length public body sponsored by the DCMS and until 2015 they were known as English Heritage. But in 2015 that split into two separate organisations. The English Heritage Trust who look after the national collection of historic places and buildings and Historic England who retain the advisory and strategic role. So Historic England have statutory functions including to provide advice to the government and oversee the National Heritage List for England. So, so this is the designated heritage assets that are legally protected. So things like listed buildings, scheduled monuments, registered parks and gardens, registered battlefields and protected wrecks. Um, heritage in England is protected through three main mechanisms. The first is designation, so things like listing for buildings and scheduling for archaeological sites. It's important to note, though, that not all important assets are protected under designation, and individual cases of designation do differ by, by site. The second is through the planning system, and this is where the majority of heritage protection occurs, which is a result of development. So the driving principle is that of polluter pays, where the, uh, the party responsible for threatening the resource so a developer, must mitigate that impact by preserving the site in situ or by preserving it through record. Um, and the third is through various stewardship schemes that seek to pay land landowners, in particular farmers, in return for delivering some benefit. And though this has delivered enormous benefits, it is also the most vulnerable, as it's linked to the European Common Agricultural Policy, and such, such subsidies face an uncertain future post-Brexit. So underpinning all of these approaches to heritage protection are two main principles. The first is that archaeology is a finite and non-renewable resource. And the second is that given its finite and non-renewable nature, the ideal situation for, archaeological site, for an archaeological site is to be preserved in situ. So Historic England, in a former life as English heritage, had a long-standing interest in climate change and has undertaken and commissioned dozens of pieces of research over several decades to help better understand the issues. With regard to climate change, Historic England have a formal role as a statutory consultee, but also have an interest in the topic from a strategic, research and operational perspective. This spans both climate change mitigation and adaptation. The climate change policy in the UK is shaped by the Climate Change Act 2008. This sets out targets for reductions of, uh, in CO2 and other greenhouse gases and ways to do it. It established the Committee on Climate Change as an independent body uh, tasked with advising government on climate change matters and reporting upon progress. There's a set cycle of reporting on the impacts of climate change and on adaptation, which is rerun every five years. Historic England have the opportunity to contribute as a statutory advisor to government on three uh, elements adaptation reporting power, climate change risk assessment, and the National Adaptation Programme. Um, most recently, they produced a report for DEFRA on adaptation to climate change that sets out how they plan to address this over the next coming five years. But Historic England are not alone in thinking strategically about climate change. There are a number of examples of notable strategies for heritage and climate change. Some recent examples are Historic Scotland's Climate Change Adapta Adaptation Plan, sorry, Historic Scotland's Climate Change Action Plan, and the United States National Park Service Cultural Resources Climate Change Strategy, both excellent examples. In the Climate Change Adapta Adaptation Report, a very simple approach was taken to simply setting out some principles and commitments for the coming five years in order to, to ensure that we're continuing to adapt to our changing climate as an organisation and as a champion of historic uh, places in England. The key commitments for the Adaptation Plan were to maintain a watching brief on climate change projections, to support the resilience of our own workforce through improving understanding of these issues and capacity to cope with extreme weather events, support resilience in the historic environment through encouraging maintenance and discouraging maladaptation, 
embed climate change adaptation and environmental risk management within projects and practices, promote the positive role that the historic environment can play in informing responses to climate change, develop an approach for dealing with inevitable change and loss, including loss, and support the English Heritage Trust in addressing climate change in its care of the National Heritage Collection. In 2012, the then English Heritage commissioned Atkins to report on the key environmental threats to the historic environment. The report identified the following as key threats or themes which, affect heritage, which can affect heritage assets. So coastal processes, this includes erosion, inundation, changes in sediment, flooding, extremes of wetting and drying, um, fluctuations in temperature, desiccation of soils and lowered groundwater levels, which increase the risk of decay to waterlogged in archaeological and paleo-environmental remains, wildfire, pests and diseases, and this is especially a big problem for historic buildings, design landscapes and organic artefacts. But none of these threats are new, however, climate change, um, none of these threats are new. Climate change is changing their frequency, intensity or locations and is therefore considered instead of a threat in its own right as a risk multiplier. And this also includes how people are choosing to respond to these threats, which in turn could have implications for the historic environment, for example, maladaptation. For some assets, in some places, mitigating the impact of climate change might not be practical or even possible. And in those cases, there will need to be a clear rationale for accepting loss. And this is actually where my own PhD work will hopefully fit in in the next few years. So all this together presents some real challenges. We have a heritage protection approach that is built upon the idea of preservation in situ, minimal intervention, of conserving the resource for future generations but we're facing changes that are accelerating the processes by which we lose heritage or lose information. Our heritage protection systems are designed to respond to active threats, for example, development. They are poorly equipped to respond to natural or attritional loss. And yet there's an expectation that an organization such as Historic England is there to protect heritage. And the types of loss that we're seeing maybe ranges from the very visual, such as the threat of erosion at Whitby, to loss that isn't visible, such as the loss of organic material and impacts of peat shrinkages um, and as a consequence of dewatering. So there's a real need to rethink our relationship with conservation of our heritage and how national organisations communicate this, this relationship effectively. There is often a source of misunderstanding and a cause of false expectation that historic England are primarily concerned with the protection of heritage. Conservation is not necessarily the same as preservation. Archaeology is, is at its heart is a practical dis discipline. We know we can't save everything. There are many natural processes at work that, we co that cause the degradation of archaeological information before we even are aware of it. Nor can we record everything. Time, money and people are finite resources and there will always be technological advances that will gather information um, that we previously didn't even think of. And of course, as every undergraduate knows, the process of archaeology in itself is destructive. So when faced with inevitable loss, what should our reaction be? Well, loss does present opportunities. It's not all bad. So the most ob ob obvious opportunity of which is discovery. For instance, the increased rates of coastal erosion and more frequent droughts are all beneficial for archaeological discovery, as the uh, archaeological deposits and sites are exposed or revealed through prop marks. But archaeological discovery brings its own challenges, particularly for an organisation like Historic England. There's an expectation that when something is revealed, somebody should act, and has, as Historic England are the funder of last resort for the emergency recording of archaeological sites of nat nat national significance, that expectation often falls to them. But in a world of diminishing public resources, this is simply not always the possible. The scale of the work can be considerable. For instance, the fire at Filingdale's Moor in Yorkshire in September 2003, which is shown up here, um, the fire devastated vegetation and the fragile peat soils for several square kilometres of half, uh, heathland. But they also revealed previously unknown archaeological landscapes. The new discoveries included prehistoric field systems, rock art, 20th century military training features and industrial features. However, the speed at which the teams had to work in order to record the exposed sites before vegetation took over again, as well as the increased erosion risk that threatened many known archaeological sites, was really challenging. In policy terms, there's a real need to be wary of expectations, to prepare for and begin the public conversation about how we can't save everything, and also to seek additional opportunities of encouraging others to undertake recording and monitoring. Which leads to another opportunity, and that's for engagement with a wider audience. So two examples of this in England are Citizen, 
who are based all around England and help monitor archaeology on the coast and intertidal zones with members of community uh, with a team of community volunteers that have all been trained by them in a wide range of archaeological recording techniques. And on the left is a memorial stone erected by the people of Kempsey in Worcestershire uh, to commemorate burials that were found during flood alleviation works. The villagers were so moved by the discovery of 42 Saxon and medieval burials um, uncovered during the works, they raised funds to erect a memorial which lies just outside the churchyard where the remains were interred. Um, but looking at public engagement with environmental science, um, we all too often uh, look at it as something we take to others, and there's a lot of scope to look at how engagement might be community driven. So a good example of this is how the SCAPE team up in Scotland have been working with communities, empowering them to identify what they think is important and what they want to do about it. And heritage can also be um, a great method of contributing in meaningful ways to wider climate change debates. The Climate Outreach Organisation is a charity that looks at ways of communicating um, climate change. They have undertaken two pieces of work that are particularly relevant to historic England. The first is the Uncertainty Habit, which is free online and talks about the importance of how we frame our messages to reach different audiences. And the second looks at how imagery is and can be used effectively to communicate. Both of these have strong messages for us as heritage professionals. The way to communicate to people is to appeal to their interests, shown rather cynically in the cartoon there. And people with conservative views who have been traditionally less receptive to climate change issues are often very keen on heritage. Through understanding how to correctly frame the language of climate change and in a way that centres heritage among climate change solutions, we can begin to influence how people engage with climate change. And for Historic England as a public body, we potentially have a lot of opportunity to influence this debate and have been more mindful about this and seeking these new opportunities. So due to the fact that we work with such long timescales, we recognise there is no purely natural landscape in England, but that our landscape and our places have been shaped by millennia of people living in them. The long view is important for a number of reasons. Using reconstruction imagery of places to help communicate how they've changed and therefore understand why they may be at risk of current flooding. Um, this is a particularly good photo of the Isles of Athelney, sorry, I'm probably mispronounced that terribly, and Eastling in Somerset where flooding is devastating for the communities affected. But as the whole landscapes become flooded, sometimes the past landscapes jump, jump out. And the Isle of Athelney in the right of the photo is a twin peaked hill containing a monastic site and a Saxon occupation site claimed to be the stronghold of Alfred the Great. And the village of East Ling is a Saxon burr, the outline of which more or less follows the area left above the flood water in the left of the photo. So looking at this picture, it's easy to see why the Saxons might have selected these locations for settlements, but also why this area might have been a good place for Alfred the Great to create a stronghold. Photos like this, combined with a historical understanding, can have quite a powerful role in explaining why these areas are at risk today, and also, as discussed with the previous slide, may reach those who otherwise don't engage with this issue. And learning from the past... Um, is something we can do. It is a phrase that gets banded about, particularly um, in the current political climate. But in terms of hin Historic England's advocacy role, there's real potential for promoting the very practical understanding that heritage perspectives can bring to contemporary and future problems. For example, traditional building materials such as lime mortars, plasters, wood and stone are often far better at recovering from flooding than modern materials. To do this without creating mal maladaptation, where improvements for adaptation to one risk inadvertently negatively affect the ability to cope with the other is the real challenge in climate change adaptation. So this is just a real brief view of Historic England's interests and work on climate change, and there is a lot more to be said. Um, Historic England have the opportunity to advocate for the relevance of the past in the contemporary challenges of climate change. They can make even more of these opportunities, especially if we are all aware of the work in the wider heritage sector that we can help make this case. So thanks for listening. I'll do my best to answer any questions, but if there is anything that I can't answer, which is probably quite a lot, um, you can contact my uh, supervisors and colleagues, uh, Hannah and Meredith, on those emails and Twitter. So thank you very much.